Hello, I am Krista Johnson. I'm a senior in political science and co-chair of the National Affairs Series and the Committee on Lectures. And now, it is my special honor to introduce our speaker tonight. His accomplishments are almost too numerous to list, so here are some highlights. He is director of the Center for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament at Australian National University and has advised the Australian and New Zealand governments on arms control and international security issues. He has served as UN Senior Advisor on Reforms, as well as Senior Vice Rector of the United Nations University in Tokyo. He was a principal author of the 2001 Responsibility to Protect Report, which the UN later adopted as guiding principles for the prevention of genocide and crimes against humanity. He is co-editor of the newly released Oxford Handbook of Modern Diplomacy, the author of more than 30 books, and writes regularly for the international press. His most recent books include The Responsibility to Protect, Norms, Laws, and the Use of Force in International Politics, as well as The People versus the State, Reflections on UN Authority, US Power, and the Responsibility to Protect. Tonight, he'll be speaking on emerging powers and the responsibility to protect. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ramesh Thucker. Thanks very much, Krista. Uh, I must say, I think I'd rather be listening to any or all of the uh, following three speakers that you mentioned. Uh, will sound very interesting. I'm here to talk, as Krista said, about the responsibility to protect, particularly from the point of view of emerging players. I'd like to begin with two quotations, uh, both or one of which might be familiar to most of you. The first goes back a very long time to the 5th century BC, and it's from Thucydides, a very familiar quotation for all of us who study international relations. The strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. The second quotation is from more recent times, and from your own Mark Twain, which not that many actually have heard of. God created war, so that Americans would learn geography. <laughs> Let me begin with four apparently unrelated issues and events. The intensified use of drones to kill foreign-based enemies has been described in a joint study by Stanford and New York law schools as violating international law international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and possibly also U.S. law. The creation of an uber surveillance state that, that spies massively and routinely on millions of Americans and foreigners has stirred an angry backlash. The refusal to prosecute the torturers and the legal enablers from the Bush regime while pursuing, prosecuting, and persecuting whistleblowers of government malfeasance shows a strange perversion of priorities in the land of the free and brave. Finally, France and the US threatened to unleash unilateral strikes on Syria until outfoxed diplomatically by the wily Russian president. Now, what common theme unites these four disparate events. Well, all of them attest to the centralization of power and authority in the White House. The Obama administration has asserted the right to act as it sees fit without transparency, congressional oversight, congressional or UN authorization, and without domestic or international judicial accountability on literally life and death decisions on Americans and foreigners alike. The primary purpose of the responsibility to protect, or to use its common acronym R2P, as we developed it back in 2001, was to provide a basis for full spectrum international action to protect victims of atrocities within a legal framework that also meets the test of global legitimacy. It 
used to be the case when I was growing up that it was die-hard conservatives who believed in quaint ideas like the rule of law. Now it seems to be part of the radical agenda to believe in the rule of law. On the first part, legal principles, the framework of laws and dispute resolution must apply, apply equally to all, the powerful and the weak, rulers and citizens, and it must govern relations among and between them. On the second part, global legitimacy cannot be achieved by collapsing the international community into the transatlantic community and substituting NATO enforcement for United Nations authorization. What Russia has done is to subject Syria to international law and UN authority. What President Obama and Secretary Kerry were demanding is Syria submit to US authority and surrender to American might. President Putin has brokered a deal to get Syria to sign the Chemical Weapons Convention and have its chemical weapons stockpile and infrastructure verifiably destroyed and dismantled by the Hague-based Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons, or the OPCW. Putin's op-ed in the New York Times was aimed at much, as much at the global as American audience. He may have irritated talking heads among the latter within the United States. He won the former, the global audience, hands down. The administration's desperate efforts to claim serious surrender of chemical weapons capability as a victory for its threat of strikes. And let me remind you, in no uncertain terms, the threat of the use of force is also illegal under the UN Charter, not just the actual use of force. This claim is not merely self-delusional. It also validates President Putin's narrative of the United States as a rogue state addicted addicted to bullying all the weaklings in the global backyard who refuse to kowtow to its dictates. The morally dubious provenance of the author, Putin, does not soften the sharp sting of his analysis. There exists a wide world out there that is much bigger than the United States or even than the transatlantic community. There are times when I think I must have had a Rip Van Winkle moment and missed the historic point at which the divine right of kings to rule over their subjects morphed into the divine right of the US administration of the day to rule over the rest of the world by executive decree, internal bureaucratic determination and presidential whim. On what basis does the US president decide who should be which other country's ruler, in other words? The world looks differently from beyond America's shores, and how we perceive and where we stand on global issues is shaped strongly by where we come from and who we are. So the worldviews of Americans and others are alike shaped by their personal and historical experiences. For example, the giants of American media collaborated with the Orwellian redefinition of common understandings of torture after 9-11. When other countries engaged in waterboarding, the Los Angeles Times and the New York Times called it torture in 86 and 91% of their articles respectively. But when Americans engaged in the practice, they called it torture in 8% and 11% respectively. Same action. Or take another example. We had a teachable moment on 17th July 2009 when Sergeant James Crowley arrested Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates in Boston. Despite individual variations, far more blacks and Hispanics than whites empathized and sympathized with Professor Gates, for they come out of the same 
historical narrative and collective consciousness. So it was a race-based difference of reactions which came out of their respective different experiences. Similarly, in world politics, at a certain level of analysis, it is possible to argue that in general, compared to the industrialized Western countries, developing countries are more suspicious of claims to a right of humanitarian intervention, more interested in justice among rather than within nations, more concerned about the root causes of terrorism, more interested in economic development than worried about nuclear proliferation, and more committed to the defense of national sovereignty than the promotion of human rights. Because their viewpoints rarely get an airing, let alone a hearing, in mainstream media, Western publics and governments have a seriously distorted understanding of many international issues. The majority of today's armed conflicts involve challenges to national integration or to the government's authority. To interveners, to Westerners, sorry, intervening to stop the bloodletting restores order around the periphery. To developing countries, international intervention is a direct threat to territorial integrity. Related to this is the terrible moral hazard of encouraging ethno-national groups everywhere to demand independence and then to back it with violence that then provokes disproportionate, harsh state retaliation, which then promotes external intervention. The likely sites and targets of intervention in the foreseeable future will be developing countries. It's their people who will suffer if mass atrocities are being committed and outsiders do not help. Or if interventions are primarily geopolitical or commercial in motivation rather than humanitarian. Conversely, they will be the principal beneficiaries if interventions are motivated mainly by humanitarian concerns and executed responsibly. But the interveners could be from among the powerful countries within developing or advanced countries, or a combination of them, acting in the region or even globally. And therefore, I think the conversation on R2P should be primarily among the governments and peoples of the developing countries, and only secondly between them and the governments and people of the advanced countries. The relevance and importance of this, of this uh, seems to be surprisingly ignored uh, in New York uh, and in many opinion capitals and journals. We are near, with a near exclusive dominance of Western names and voices. That's not just wrong in principle. In terms of practical politics too, as power and influence seep out of the US-led transatlantic order and migrate towards Asia and elsewhere, how and by who will the transition be managed? Interventions were frequent before R2P formulated, was formulated in 2001. Interventions are not guaranteed after R2P's unanimous endorsement by world leaders in 2005. So the choice is not if intervention, but whether the intervention will be ad hoc or rules-based, unilateral or multilateral, and divisive or consensual. R2P, especially when backed by legitimacy criteria agreed to in advance, will help to shift the balance towards interventions that are rules-based, multilateral, and consensual. The debate on R2P is not and ought not to be a north-south issue. But it can be turned into one, either because of self-serving claims by the governments of key emerging countries, 
or because of calculated neglect of their legitimate concerns by a declining West. Many non-Western societies do have their own historical tradition of reciprocal rights and obligations that bind sovereigns and subjects. As argued by our Commission Co-Chair Mohamed Sainoun from Algeria, in many ways R2P is a distinctly African contribution to global norms, not the other way around. So don't think of it as a global norm domesticated into Africa, but as an African norm exported to the global community. Many traditional Asian cultures also stress the symbiotic link between duties owed by kings to subjects and loyalty of citizens to sovereigns. In India, Emperor Ashok from the 3rd century BC transcribed the following message on a rock edict. And I quote, this is my rule, governments by the law, administration according to the law, gratification of my subjects under the law, and protection through the law. So he's already talking about protection of people through the law in the 3rd century BC in India. Modern India's constitution imposes R2P type responsibility on governments in its chapter on fundamental rights and directive principles of state policy. The emerging players, more than any other group of states, will have to ensure that through global governance mechanisms and international accountability instruments, one, vulnerable groups are protected from predations by brutish rulers domestically. Two, weak countries are protected from the predations of regional or global major powers. And three, violators of both sets of norms on the use of force are made to answer for their transgressions. In other words, if I had a bumper sticker slogan for R2P, it should be, governments beware. Thou shalt not kill, either domestically or internationally, without due authority, without due process, and in defiance of the rule of law. So it's back to that effort to bring a framework of legal rules within global legitimacy for protecting victims of civilian atrocities. R2P spoke eloquently to the need to change the United Nations normative framework in line with the changed reality of threats and victims in today's world. It is the normative instrument of choice for converting a shocked international conscience into decisive collective action for channeling individual moral indignation into collective policy remedies to prevent and stop atrocities. In the vacuum of responsibility for the safety of the marginalized, stigmatized, and dehumanized outgroup, outgroup subject to mass atrocities, R2P provides an entry point for the international community to step in and take up the moral and military slack. Paired down to its essence, the responsibility to protect is the acceptance of a duty of care by all of us who live in zones of safety towards those trapped in zones of danger. It strikes a balance <coughs> between unilateral interference rooted in the arrogance of power and institutionalized indifference that dislocates the other from the self. The International Commission, the full name was International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty. That's a mouthful. It will take up an extra hour if I repeat it all the time. So I'll, ref I'll refer to it from now on as ISIS. ISIS was successful in repositioning the international consensus 
because we rejected the language and discourse of humanitarian intervention. During the intense and extensive consultations all around the world in every continent that we undertook in 2001, we quickly discovered the visceral hostility to any so-called right of humanitarian intervention, a hostility that extended across the developing world, rooted in their historical encounter with the West in the era of colonialism. To dismiss their claims and stay with the language of humanitarian intervention is to deny their history and disrespect their collective memory. Now, I grew up in India, which once was part of the British Empire, the jewel in the crown, supposedly. You'll recall the saying, the sun never set on the British Empire at its height. Well, I grew up with the explanation that the reason for the sun never setting on the British Empire was that even God would not trust an Englishman in the dark. <laughs> Moreover, the concept is a euphemism in the real world. If we go back to 1999, NATO's humanitarian intervention in Kosovo was in reality three months of bombing. We ruled out ground troops from the beginning, if you remember, President Clinton said we are not going to send ground troops. The use of humanitarian bombing immediately points up the damaging contradiction in juxtaposing the two words. But isn't that what NATO action was? Humanitarian bombing. If humanitarian intervention is okay, why not humanitarian bombing? In addition, unlike humanitarian intervention, R2P puts the needs and interests of the victims of atrocities ahead of the needs and interests and rights of the intervening states. Variations notwithstanding, from this extensive ISIS outreach I referred to, I draw eight conclusions overall. One, the term humanitarian should never be associated with war. Humanitarianism is good, interventionism is bad, humanitarian intervention amounts to marrying evil to good, in the words of one of our Chinese interlocutors at the time. In such a shotgun marriage, far from humanitarianism burnishing meddlesome interventions, it will itself be tarnished by interventionism. And while that was in China, uh, in Africa, someone threw a question at us, which was, if a vegetarian is someone who eats only vegetables, what does that make a humanitarian? Second, the use of force for moral reasons is dangerous and counterproductive in its practical effects. It can encourage warring parties inside a country to be rigid and irresponsible in the hope of internationalizing the conflict, the so-called moral hazard, or it can facilitate interventions by those exploiting the cloak of legality for their own purposes. Both can prolong or cause large-scale sufferings. Three, there's an in inherent conceptual incoherence. The individualistic conception of human rights in Western discourse is somehow mystically transformed into collective rights, the protection of groups of people, at the same time as the collective rights of the entire nation are still denied legitimacy. Four, the inconsistent practice, the double standards, and the sporadic nature of Western power's interest in human rights protection shows that noble principles are convenient cloaks for hegemonic interests. Five, the results of Western intervention had not always been beneficial, to put it politely and sometimes had aggravated the crises and created fresh problems. Six, the United Nations has a central and indispensable role as the sole agent for lawful authorization. Seven, interventions cannot become the pretext for, for imposing external political preferences with regard to regimes and political and economic systems. Cases justifying intervention, therefore, must be tightly restricted 
to such heinous crimes as genocide and mass murders. There must always be the option of last resort. There must be temporary, and they must be guided by considerations of political impartiality and neutrality between the domestic political contenders. Eighth and finally, they must respect and ensure the territorial integrity of the state in which interventions are carried out. Our report was published in December 2001. Its main thrust was endorsed unanimously by world leaders in 2005. Their reformulation added clarity, rigor, and specificity, limiting the triggering events to war crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. And so realigning the emerging global political norm with existing categories of international legal crimes. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's successive special reports, one a year since 2009, have sustained and consolidated the new international consensus. Civil society organizations have promoted a vigorous process of R2P norm socialization and crystallization. The annual debates by the UN General Assembly have helped to forge a shared understanding of R2P, to distinguish it from humanitarian intervention, and to align it with building capacity to help states exercise their sovereignty more effectively. So that's by way of abstract general conceptual background, and as I'm happy to go through the process in detail uh, later on if anyone wants. But let me apply what this means to two recent cases, Libya and Syria. Uh, short digression on Libya, uh, and then I want to come to Syria. Whereas originally I had meant to speak about Libya, but during the times uh, from when I agreed to do this and now the world has moved on. The use of force, no matter how benevolent, enlightened, and impartial in intent, has empirical consequences. It shapes the struggle for power and helps to determine the outcome of that political contest. That is why it is inherently controversial, contentious, and contested. Libya was the first road test of the coercive, sharp military edge of R2P. Its invocation was almost a textbook illustration of R2P principles. But its implementation proved the need for legitimacy criteria to guide decisions on authorizing and overseeing international military intervention. R2P was the discourse of choice in debating how best to respond to the crisis in Libya in 2011. And the Security Council, for the first time, invoked R2P under the coercive Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Although successful, however, the Libyan operation proved controversial and contested, and the price of overreach in Libya by NATO has been paid by the people of Syria. The Libyan experience also confirms that the debate on military interventions cannot avoid questions of regime legitimacy, state capacity, and state building. Security Council Resolution 1973 authorized the use of all necessary measures to protect civilians and civilian populated areas. In the Balkans, it took NATO a decade to intervene with air power in Kosovo in 1999. In Libya, it took just one month to mobilize a broad coalition, secure a UN mandate, establish and enforce no kill zones, stop Gaddafi's advancing army, and prevent a massacre of the innocents in Benghazi. And this remarkable speed and unity was due principally to the new norm of R2P. So the outcome was a triumph for R2P. It is possible for the international community working through the authenticated UN-centered 
structures and procedures of organized multilateralism to deploy international force to neutralize the military might of a tug and intervene between him and his victim and his victims to protect the latter. By now, however, however there are two sets of serious reservations about the Libya experience. First, ongoing volatility and violence continue to cast a long shadow over post-Gaddafi Libya's stability and commitment to a liberal democratic culture. Second, NATO ignored Resolution 1973 restrictions to effect regime change, spurned hints of any willingness by Gaddafi to negotiate a ceasefire, intervened in the internal civil war, and broke the UN's arms embargo to supply arms to the rebels. NATO denials to the contrary rest on quote-unquote legal sophistries. That's from a study by RUSI, the Royal United Services Institution. Uh, the closest equivalent in the States would be uh, the, the War Veterans Association or something. So it's, it's the military institution study that says you're engaging in legal sophistries if you deny that you actually did all this. And because of that, these sophistries enrage rather than placate the critics. All the BRICS countries, for example, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, objected strongly to the shift from the politically neutral posture of civilian protection to the partial goal of assisting the rebels and pursuing regime change. It's against that background that you have to understand not just China's and Russia's, but much of the rest of the world's hostility to talk of a strike on Syria uh, back in, in August in particular. By the end of 2011, the peaceful Arab Spring had mutated into a bloody and vicious civil war in Syria. But that crisis is not solely an internal crisis in and about Syria. It is simultaneously also about the hardening Sunni-Shia divide across the Islamic Crescent, and also simultaneously about relations with Iran, Russia, and China. From the start, it was difficult to see how any outside intervention in Syria, therefore, would pass the balance of consequences test. First, make sure that you do not do more harm than the good you are going to attempt to do. The caution about another Western invasion of yet another Muslim country deepened with the low odds of success and the good odds of unintended come perverse consequences in attacking a more formidable enemy in a more volatile strategic environment. China and Russia were resolutely opposed to any resolution in the Security Council that could set in train a sequence of events leading to a 1973 type authorization for outside military operations. They warned that such a resolution would put Syria on the path to a civil war. The Security Council is not in the business of imposing an internal political settlement on member states and dictating who stays in power and who must go. Opposition groups also must be condemned for their use of violence and exhorted to engage constructively with the government. And the only solution to the Syrian crisis is through an inclusive Syrian-led process. Unquestionably, there are strategic and economic imperatives behind Russia's policy in particular. But I also put it to you that the strength of the Sino-Russian opposition reflects a conflict of political approaches and a rejection of armed domestic confrontation backed by international enablers to pursue regime change. The crisis came to a head of sorts after the use of chemical weapons in the Damascus suburbs on 21st August this year. The ensuing global debate showed three sets of concerns. 
facts yet to be established, insufficient thought to the goal and aftershocks of the strikes, and unclear legal basis of the strikes. Let me go through each of these in turn. Facts. Reading from a distance, it seems to me that leading American politicians have routinely condemned Assad of having massacred more than 100,000 of his people. So do some analysts and commentators who should know better. The figure of more than 100,000 represents the total number killed in Syria on all sides. The best available estimate breaks that figure down as follows. 40,000 rebels, sorry, 40,000 civilians, 22,000 rebels, 27,000 government soldiers, 18,000 pro-regime militias, others an unknown 3,000, total 110,000. So the civilians is 45,000. The total number is 110,000. That's people on all sides. So let's get the figures right. Second, on facts, the West didn't help its credibility problem by jumping from allegations that chemical weapons had been used, which few denied, to conclusions that they were used by the regime, and therefore military retaliation was justified and necessary. Washington failed to establish the chain of custody from manufacture or import to storage, deployment, decision to use, and use. And after Colin Powell's famous performance in the Security Council with regard to Iraq, I'm sorry, the rest of the world ain't going to buy just assertions coming out of Washington. We need more conclusive evidence, hard evidence than that. Strategic logic, common sense, and circumstantial evidence are contradictory even today. Syria flouted the global norm to be one of just five countries not to have signed the convention banning chemical weapons and destroying stockpiles. The rebels were losing the war and desperate to entangle the United States on their side. President Obama, unwisely I think, had drawn a red line around the use of chemical weapons. Unwise because that was an open invitation to rebels who were callous and clever enough to stage an attack on their own people and implicate the regime as the perpetrator. Assad, winning the war, had no reason to use his weapons, and every reason not to. As President Putin said in his New York Times op-ed, and I quote, no one doubts that poison gas was used in Syria, but there is every reason to believe it was used not by the Syrian army, but by opposition forces to provoke intervention by their powerful foreign patrons who would be siding with the fundamentalists, unquote. We haven't seen any evidence to back that assertion, but it makes sense in logic that that's what they were aimed for. Using chemical weapons so close to Damascus to target such a tiny rebel force with a UN inspection team in the country would be sheer stupidity on the part of the regime. On the other hand, circumstantial evidence does point that way. But then circumstantial evidence also shows that the rebels may have used chemical weapons on a much smaller scale back in March. And we know that in July, Turkish police caught several al-Nusra jihadists with two kilograms of, sa of sarin, the nerve agent. So the evidence to date, while not definitive, does point the finger of crim criminality at the regime for the 21st August, August incident. Why do I say circumstantial, circumstantial evidence? Well, only the Syrian army has the capability to mount such an attack. Eyewitness accounts indicate that the rockets came from government-held territory. The regime has passed form on chemicals use, and the types of rockets used are believed to belong to the government inventory. A German newspaper citing findings based on phone calls intercepted by German intelligence, reports that President Assad did not personally order the chemical weapons attack. On the contrary, he rejected several requests from military commanders to use chemical weapons against regime opponents in recent months.
on this contradictory evidence logic, where do I stand personally? Well, I come to two conclusions. One, Russia and China cannot convincingly argue that Assad forces have never used chemical weapons during the two years of the civil war. Two, the West cannot convincingly argue that rebel forces have never used chemical weapons during the two years of the civil war. So it doesn't help in terms of the next argument, which is moral purpose. A war-weary public doubts that the West has any dog in the fight in the Syrian civil war, where a rebel commander filmed himself eating the heart of a government soldier, and almost half the rebel fighters are jihadists. Obama failed to communicate why an attack on Syria would be in the U.S. national interest, why it would not damage the principle of international law on interstate relations, how the strikes would weaken Assad without strengthening and emboldening al-Qaeda, how they would protect Christians and other minorities from being attacked by Islamist extremists, and how they would end the vicious civil war. Consequently, there was strong and rising public, military, and congressional opposition to the threatened strikes in Syria, even after the administration's statement of case for them. In fact, the polls seem to show that as we went along and the more the administration argued this case, the support declined because people focused on it and realized how thin the case was. Hoary slogans were dragged from the cobwebs of history to suggest that the world was facing a Munich moment, Kerry in Paris, in trying to appease instead of confronting a Hitler-like dictator. If that was the scale and gravity of the threat, what would be the point of strikes that would be unbelievably small, narrow, limited? How would it impact the stability of the strategically vital region? How was it connected to a wider diplomatic strategy for resolving this Syria conflict? Little wonder that Kerry's claim about this being unbelievably small was rejected almost immediately by the president, who said the US military doesn't do pinpricks. There's no clarity about how, where, and by what means China, Russia, Iran, and the Shia militias would retaliate. Russia's attitude was described by one of their middle experts as, and it's a, it's a nice quote, in a race across a minefield, it is wise to let other runners overtake you. If the strikes do lead to Assad's ouster, power would quickly fall into the hands of an even more murderous anti-Western regime allied to Al-Qaeda. The ouster of Saddam Hussein, in effect, delivered Iraq to Iran. Does Washington really want to deliver Syria to the Al-Qaeda next? What are the risks, known and unknown, as Donald Rumsfeld might ask? No use of air power is ever surgical. Large numbers of innocent people get killed always. Nor does an air war always end cleanly and decisively. Even limited and narrow airstrike sucks the United States into the vortex of Syria's civil war. Which recent Western intervention has left a rosy afterglow instead of death, destruction, and broken nations? Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya? Is the West determined to prove the truth of Einstein's observation that, un in that insanity lies in doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result each time. If the main goal was to send a message, then the BBC reported a man at a town hall, town hall meeting in Ohio who captures this complexity, I think, the best. What are cruise missiles going to do but kill people? If Obama wants to send Assad a message, text him. On the legality, legitimacy, almost all countries and peoples abhor chemical weapons and support the enforceable ban on its use. 
but the prohibition on the use of military force against other states, except in self-defense or under UN authorization, is much more crucial to the direct security. For example, of countries in the Asia Pacific, in the shadow of China as it rises again and contests US primacy in the Pacific. So of course from Australia's point of view, we abhor the use of chemical weapons against civilians in Syria. But the rule that major powers may not use force unless under attack themselves or under UN authorization, that is much more crucial to us for our national security as China becomes more and more powerful. Military action without UN authorization would violate international law. No foreign country has been attacked by Syria. The Kosovo precedent from 1999 is no help. Contrary to the dominant NATO view, majority world opinion is that at best, the NATO operation in 1999 was illegal but legitimate in the circumstances. At worst, it was both illegal and illegitimate. So Iraq in 2003 is the more relevant comparison. We worked hard in 2001 to craft R2P to distinguish it from the deeply controversial NATO humanitarian intervention in Kosovo. We then spent many years convincing several skeptical governments that this was a change of substance, not just language. If NATO were to launch military strikes on Syria by misusing R2P language, they will succeed in turning R2P into RIP. They will also, I think, sow the seeds of NATO's own destruction, for it will have been transformed from the original alliance to protect members from an attack by the Soviet Union into an alliance to wage an aggressive war against a country outside Europe that has not attacked a single NATO power. You remember the famous saying about NATO by its first Secretary General, Lord Ismay, the purpose of NATO is to keep the Americans in, the Germans down, and the Soviets out. NATO Mark II, in this century, I think, the purpose is to keep the Americans in, the Russians down, and the United Nations out. No principle of international law permits one state to attack another to uphold a multilateral treaty. The legal mechanisms and remedies for dealing with alleged crimes of chemical weapons use are set out in the Chemical Weapons Convention and also in the 1925 Geneva Protocol. Recourse to these would signify collective determination to uphold the global norm against chemical weapons use and they would strengthen these treaty regimes. Unilateral strikes, by contrast, would take the world back into the law of the jungle, dressed up as international law enforcement. The Chemical Weapons Convention translates the world's moral repugnance of chemical weapons into a legally binding treaty. Signed by 189 states, it has been in force since 1997. Only five countries have not signed, Angola, Egypt, North Korea, South Sudan, and Syria, and Syria now is coming on board. Israel and Burma have signed but not yet ratified. The OPCW has overseen the verified destruction of more than 80% of the world's declared stockpile of 72,000 metric tons of chemical agents. All major powers from west and east, north and south, should collaborate to promote the universalization of the treaty. Given the identity of one of the holdouts, this might pose more of a problem to the US and the West than to Russia and China. To come back to my main theme about emerging powers, the global rebalancing underway embraces military, geopolitical, economic, and even moral adjustments to the shifts in power, wealth, influence, and ideas of good governance and civic virtue. Westerners have lost their previous capacity to set standards and rules of behavior for the whole world. As Brazil, China, India, among others, emerge as important growth centers in the world, the age of the West disrespecting the rest's role, relevance, and voice is ebbing. 
But if we reverse that direction of analysis, so far the signs are that the new players in the global block are more interested in the status and trappings of power than in assuming the burdens of leadership that come with the territory. Nor is it clear that they have the institutional capacity to connect national aspirations of rapid economic development and political stability to breaking, to breaking global gridlocks on such issues as democratization, political and market freedoms, civil liberties, and human rights. So when Ambassador Rao is here next week, a question to be directed to her might well be, how and when do you see India being transformed into a rule shaper, where you begin to take responsibility for setting the global norms, not just rejecting what others are proposing? The increasingly confident BRICs resent calls for responsible stakeholder policies when by responsibility is meant you accept the rules that we have set. The debate on how best to operationalize R2P requires a respectful conversation among proponents and skeptics over when, how, and by whom to execute the international responsibility to protect. The consensus in our commission in 2001 and at the United Nations in and since 2005 resulted from a genuine North-South dialogue. Had R2P merely repackaged the Western humanitarian warrior's wishes and brushed aside the sensitivities of the formerly colonized, it never would have gained rapid uptake and traction, culminating un unanimous endorsement by world leaders in 2005. That R2P consensus underpinning Resolution 1973 in Libya was damaged by gaps in expectation, communication, and accountability between those who mandated the operation and those who executed it. In response, Brazil offered a paper called Responsibility While Protecting. Its two key elements are to formulate an agreed set of criteria or guidelines to help the Security Council in the debate before an R2P military intervention is authorized in order to achieve consensus. And second, a monitoring or review mechanism to ensure that the Security Council retains an oversight role over the operation during implementation in order to sustain that consensus. Like Brazil, other critics also, I think, should engage with R2P and seek to improve the means and manner of implementing the norm. And then they will become joint and responsible stakeholders in the emerging new world order. Conversely, as long as the rising new powers remain concerned mainly with consolidating national power aspirations and less with developing norms and institutions of global governance, I think they will remain incomplete powers, limited by their narrow ambitions with the material grasp being longer than the normative reach. Just to conclude, the collision of different UN Charter norms that produced the heated and tense debates over humanitarian intervention in the 1990s reflected, I think, a growing erosion of the sense of community among the different members of the family of nations. As well as strongly held beliefs in contrary directions, states and peoples no longer share a common belief in the means and procedures by which to resolve their differences. Reframing humanitarian intervention as a responsibility to protect at least re-established an international consensus. However, the implementation of the sharp military end of R2P in Libya and the failure of civilian protection in Syria show that the global consensus on R2P is tenuous and fragile rather than robust and resilient. Success in an R2P intervention is no more self-guaranteeing than in any other type of external intervention. Good intentions is not a magical formula by which to shape good outcomes in foreign lands. On the contrary, there is no humanitarian crisis so grave that it cannot be made worse by an external military intervention. 
the use of force, therefore, must always, always be the option of last resort, not the tool of choice for dealing with threatened or occurring atrocities. Equally, however, it must remain as the tool of last resort. It cannot be taken off the table. But R2P action for protective intervention must also be, not should be, but must be, UN authorized in accordance with the UN Charter and for civilian protection, not punishment, not regime change. Thank you very much. Shall I just take the questions from here? Okay. Well, there are. There's obviously a mic in there, so if you can queue up behind the microphone and take your turn for questions or comments. Uh, can you turn it on before you? It's not on. Uh, the Hans Blix, for those of you who couldn't hear, the question is about Hans Blix and his team, the UN team of weapons inspectors in Iraq. What we do know now fairly definitively is that the UN team was successfully in completely disarming Saddam Hussein of all weapons of mass destruction. It would be nice to have people in Washington actually acknowledge that, uh, but they haven't done so. No. No, that, that is not true. We actually have records of what was destroyed and when and where. That is a detailed inventory that is available. Uh, uh, just one other thing about Hans Blix. I'm well, I, yes, I, I cannot comment on the American media. I don't follow it. Uh, fortunately, nor am I responsible for the American media. But I, I was going to say one more thing about Hans Blix since you mentioned that name. Uh, when these stories about the surveillance came up, uh, some journalists went to him and said, Mr. Blix, it is reported that not just your office, uh, but your house was bugged as well. Do you have a comment on that? He said, my problem is not that they were bugging me. My problem is they weren't listening to what I was saying. Uh, I think that's probably a question better directed to people like Professor McCormick who study and teach U.S. foreign policy. The uh, Council on Foreign Relations is certainly an influential organization, uh, but there's no shortage of influential organizations in this country, uh, and, and the degree of influence they exercise depends in part on the party in power in the White House uh, and in part on individual access as people go back and forth. Uh, can I also say that one of the great strengths of American de uh, democracy and you are unique in this as far as I know in the world, is the way senior people and lower level people as well go in and out of government, academia, civil society, and, and the private sector. I think that adds infinitely to the vigor and strength and resilience of our democracy.
and I wish uh, my country would follow that example. Goodness, either you're a very tired lot or I've been very convincing. Go ahead, please. Oh, the mic isn't working, so you might as well, yeah. It's working. It is working, okay. There you go. Can you hear me better this yep. way? Uh, you mentioned the situation in Kosovo, and you were mentioning how um, it's not really right to combine a military intervention with a humanitarian sort of an effort. And I'm curious, if you were Bill Clinton, what would you have done to stop the killing in Kosovo? There are, Kosovo is a more complicated issue for a number of reasons. Uh, it, it goes back, one, to a question of timing. Uh, the, the difficulty is at the time when the atrocities are their worst, it's not so easy to force consensus in democratic countries because it's a time-consuming process. So by the time you act, it may not actually be as bad, and you end up triggering another problem. Uh, the second problem there is they claim to be acting in the name of the international community with no evidence to support that claim whatsoever. I think they could have taken the case to the General Assembly, and they were, I think they would have got the votes. We have a procedure in the UN system, which goes back to the Korean War, interestingly, uh, where under the so-called Uniting for Peace Resolution, you can demand and convene a session of the General Assembly under, emergency, under special session and under emergency special session. In the latter case, it is required to be convened within 48 hours. It deals only with the matter to hand. It may not have long speeches and distracting issues, and you can take a vote. And if you do that, and in that case, I think almost certainly they would have got a two-thirds majority, that can substitute for inaction in the Security Council if you don't want to do that, it means you're not confident of your numbers uh, in, in, in the community. Now, the other extenuating circumstance in the case of Kosovo also is it is accepted that regional organizations can play a peace and security maintenance role within their area of operations, and they may have legitimacy in claiming that on border, and Kosovo certainly fits on border things. So it's a more complicated issue, but that's why I said at best one opinion would be that it was illegal, illegal but legitimate. Majority opinion still thinks it was both, or, or at worst, it was both illegal and illegitimate. So it, there are complexities there. Remember also the NATO had been playing an enforcement role for a decade under UN authorization and resolutions over different issues. Uh, and there never was a single Balkans resolution that was vetoed in the Security Council, by the way, not one. The only one that was vetoed was the uh, preventive force in Macedonia, but that had nothing to do with the Balkans issue. It was China-Taiwan issue. So they didn't, in other words, I don't think they got the politics right, uh, but they went in and acted. So there was someone else? Yeah. How do you feel a state should respond to genocide, such as we saw in Rwanda and most recently South Sudan, how do you feel states should respond towards that genocide that's going on in between, not states, but between rebel forces? Well, the responsibility to protect and genocide prevention are very closely linked, uh, and civilian protection is, is very closely linked. Rwanda and Srebrenica and Kosovo and East Timor, those were the four important cases from the second half of the or mid, mid to second half of the 1990s that affected our thinking and our recommendations and conclusions and report in our in, in our system the responsibility to protect so there were the triggers to uh, the call for a new consensus and the production of the new consensus in Rwanda all the evidence we have suggests that we could have stopped that genocide with early decisive forceful action uh, General Delay uh, still argues, and he's argued it personally to me, that if he had been given just 5,000 more well-armed and uh, authorized troops, he could have stopped the genocide in his tracks. South Sudan, 
like Syria, you get into a more difficult issue in terms of the, the, the size of the country, the difficulties of apportioning blame. You know, in Syria, even if you say, for example, that it's 30% rebels' fault, 70% government's fault, you cannot intervene with a 70%, 30% target. You can't say, well, direct 70% of our firepower at the regime and 30% against the rebels. It doesn't work like that. Then there's the balance of consequences. How confident can you be that you will achieve the good you set out to do and you won't actually make the situation worse? Soon as you have foreign forces, there does tend to be this reaction of unifying all different groups against the foreign invader. We've seen that happen time and time again, so it's no longer a surprise. Uh, the, the, the story, even in South Sudan, since they got their independence now, is, is not necessarily a, a good news story. There are complexities there as well. So I think you need to go through all of that uh, and identify you know, where are the troops going to come from, who's willing to provide the troops, how committed and how well trained are they with respect to uh, respecting international humanitarian law conventions. You very quickly get into these difficulties. Uh, the one thing I'm very reluctant to accept is that if there has to be intervention, it must always be the West. Uh, I think some regional actors and regional, uh, regionally powerful countries uh, have to acknowledge their share of the responsibility for what's happening in their region. You couldn't have had East Timor such a successful outcome without Australia leading that. Well, okay, Australia is the leading military power in the region. It happened in the region. That makes sense. But that means if something happens in South Asia, India has to take up that slack. If something happens in East Asia, it will have to be between Japan and China. If something happens, really bad happens in, uh, in Myanmar, for example, I don't think it's fair to expect that the United States should send in the cavalry or NATO should act. That's the responsibility of regional powers. In this case, it would be China, Japan, India, maybe Indonesia, and ASEAN as a grouping. So I think we have to identify all of these factors and who the actors, lead military actors are going to be, you're not going to get a successful, sustained intervention unless there's one regionally powerful state whose interests are engaged. Because purely altruistic motives are not going to get you a sustained, if necessary, heavy combat duty intervention. You have to have that. But the reason for the intervention must not be the national interests of the country concerned but protection of the civilian victims. And that was the case in East Timor. I don't think Australia intervened to pursue its national agenda. So those sorts of considerations have to inform everything. And, and we took the position, and I think every incident since then had confirmed the, the judgment, that each issue will be judged on its own because each contingency is different. You cannot be overly prescriptive in setting out these are the criteria, tick, 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 therefore we must go in. It doesn't work like that. So we didn't specify numbers or proportions. We said large-scale killings. Now that's got to transform into this. So it, it's, it's never an easy issue. We're not dealing with an easy problem. I don't want military intervention to become the norm. It has to be an exceptional thing because we have to be confident that when we go in, we see it through, and the outcome at the end of the process is good rather than bad. Thank you so much for coming tonight and for the rest of you for coming to hear his lecture. Just a reminder that we have a reception over there and a book signing if any of you are interested in sticking around for that. Uh, you can